is a heterogeneous group embracing a varied history, socioeconomic background, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but basically we're not all the same. Um, we're, we're all different kinds of Latinos being, or, or, uh, being put under this big umbrella, which we'll talk about more. Um, approximately 40% of Latinos in the U.S. are foreign born and 60% were born in the U.S. Again, uh, putting perspective around who's here, who's not here, and certainly um, th th these are one of the challenges or one of the things that if you identify as Latino, and uh, certainly I've had this experience in a lot of folks who identify as Latino, is, ooh, where, where do you come from or where were you born? All these kind of questions, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then many families have mixed immigration status. 75% of children in immigrant families are U.S. citizens. So just wanted to put some frame around that perspective around population. And then um, in that aspect, I actually was curious to know what was or what is the population of Latinos in general in Colorado. Um, and so the sources there um, can definitely look it up. And so there's between 730,000, 735,000 to a million Latinos uh, as of 2010. And then according to the Pew Research Center, um, close to the same number based on the 2014 census. So again, I just wanted to put perspective of how big is the community. Because a lot of times, um, one of the things that we do at, at the National Latina Network, we do a lot of, we also help with organizational assessment with what we call quote unquote mainstream organizations who are trying to engage Latino survivors. And so a lot of times they don't know how or the question is, well, you know, why don't they come to us? And so a lot of times folks may not know how to find Latino communities and, it, and it's really a systemic issue, but just wanted to put some frame around that. So getting into the conversation, and this is a question, so, and if you can please respond to this question, and I think this may seem like a simple, obvious question, but it's always good to check in with folks. It's like, what is culture? So if folks could do me the favor of just typing in, it's like, define for yourself, what is culture? That would be awesome for the next couple of seconds. And I think part of this question is to really, um, I don't want to assume what folks know or how they define culture. Um, so it's very important to me when we have this conversation is what is culture? What does it mean to you? And I think a lot of times culture is sometimes only referenced to um, um, racial or ethnic groups. Um, and we forget that also folks who are from other communities also have culture. So I just wanted to make sure to ask what is culture? Um, but what is culture really revolves around so many things. It's not just based on racial or ethnic identity. Uh, we can be talking about people, the clothes that they wear, child rearing um, uh, practices. We can talk about food. We can talk about art, jokes, medical cures, language. All of these things kind of fit into what is culture and how we define it. But it's also a lot more broader because we also can look and we can also include geographic location. We can include um, uh, what the economic situation is of the community. So that's all part of culture. And then I don't know if, if folks have seen this before, but a lot of times when we talk about culture, we kind of tend to just stick to very surface issues. We talk about foods, we talk about holidays, music, but that really doesn't get to the core of what culture is and going deeper and having these conversations a lot more deeper because people may be scared, may be um, misinterpreting sometimes or may be afraid to ask certain questions because they're afraid they may come off as offensive or what have you. But I think we have to certainly dive a lot more um, intentionally into these conversations and looking at, at not just talking about food and all of these things, but looking at communication styles and rules like eye contact, um, if touching is a very big part of, the of, the, of that person's culture or cultural identity, 
uh, conversational patterns in different social situations, um, notions of courtesy and manners, leadership, modesty, even standards of beauty, um, concepts of time, fairness and justice, then attitudes towards elders, how elders are seen in the community, um, youth or minors, adolescents, um, expectations, and then approaches to religion, courtship, marriage, decision making, problem solving, and these are things that we all are in, are all influenced by. There is, uh, it may be interpreted differently, and of course in this context we'll be talking about Latino communities within the, within the intersections of gender-based violence issues, and they certainly be reflected differently, but I think these are things that we're all influenced by, and we all have to be aware. And I think when we're really being intentional about how to engage Latino or Latino survivors or Latino communities who may be impacted by some form of gender-based violence, whether it's sexual assault, intimate partner violence, human trafficking, child abuse, elder abuse, we really have to start looking at the cultural basis of certain things of how certain communities react to these forms of victimization or violent crime or interpersonal crime or interpersonal violence. Jose Juan, so we, yes. it took just a second for people to type in their response to your culture question, but some of the responses okay. that we got was values and traditions that were passed down, including feud, mm -hmm. music uh, festivities, language mm -hmm. and religion, um, shared language, tradition, food, dress, practices, music, understandings, and norms. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and a lot of times, uh, if I dare say, a lot of times for those of us who went, who got, you know, through our formal education and training around um, uh, avoiding, um, you know, uh, like not receiving gifts or something from a survivor or a client or a victim or however you want to term the language that you use in your particular uh, organization, you know, in my experience, when I used to do home visits, and I come from a border town in Brownsville, Texas, which is the southern, southernmost tip of the state of Texas, which is predominantly all Latinos, primarily from Mexican descent, you know, and doing a home visit, when someone offered me a cup of water, that was very significant. And if I were to turn them down, that would be very insulting to them. Because that could be, because food for some communities, especially, um, and again, I want to also want to caveat this conversation that what I say here today does not mean that applies to all Latinos. These are just basically I'm giving you the benefit of my professional and personal experience in this, in the, as identifying as Latino of Mexican descent within this context, within this field. Um, so I just want to make sure people understand that. Um, not accepting that cup of coffee or that cup of water could result in that person are shutting off for me. So I understanding that for some communities, food is a great way of communication, of showing appreciation. So quite often at Casa de Esperanza, any, um, any event that we have with community, we always try to have food in those spaces. Um, although so I know that because I'm always receiving government funding, food is not allowed, but we definitely at Casa de Esperanza, we have tried to find ways around this. Uh, issue and so we you know again food is a very important concept or our way of communication or building trust uh, with certain communities so thank you for y'all for sharing that um, the next question I always like to ask is because I think when you start adding layers or adjectives to a certain question it changes the it reframes the answer perhaps so for the next couple of seconds if folks could uh, tap in the responses what is Latino Latina culture and whatever your assumptions are, just put them, you know, if you're okay with that, just can you, you can just type them in. You know, what are some of the things you have heard that is Latino culture? Our first response is Latino culture can be uh, so varied and diverse. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. It is definitely varied and diverse, but what else have you heard around what is Latino culture? Respecting, uh, respecting our elders, family above work, a strong bond uh -huh. between close families, including uh, immediate and distant family, sometimes speaking different languages in the community and home. Exactly. Machismo, a women's rights. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Cool. So um, it's interesting that some folks use the term machismo and women's rights, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but I think I also want to mind folks, remind, fo remind folks and be very, being very mindful of what do we mean by when we use the term machismo, and then uh, which seems to be uh, carries a lot of connotations around that. And definitely we'll talk more about terminology in a bit. And then women's rights, um, a lot of times um, the perception could be that women have no um, equity in Latino communities, um, which is true, but it's also true about other communities as well. So I think uh, when we talk more about language and terminology, we'll bring those aspects, but thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think in reality, when I'm asking this question is, what are some stereotypes you've actually heard around Latino, Latino communities? But again, just like before, I just want to reiterate the fact that just like any community, any culture, you know, there's traditions, there's cultural values, and again, there they're may be interpreted differently or referenced differently or expressed differently. Um, so we have traditions such, such as food, music, celebrations, cultural values like around uh, colectivismo or familial familismo, which basically means we're centered around, we operate as a collective or as a group, and there's group thinking, and then family is part of the, probably the biggest construct around collective thinking. But again, that could also be a stereotype, but it could also be a strength. Um, talk around faith and spirituality for, for a lot of commu Latino communities, and I use the term plural communities, faith and spirituality is a big construct, a very or foundational piece of their uh, belief system and certainly was part of mine. Uh, strength and resiliency is also important to talk about because I think a lot of times um, when we do talk about uh, specifics around certain communities, in this case Latino communities, we sometimes only tend to bring up the negative or um, or just focus on, and really not focus on, that could also be a strength of around uh, uh, strong collective thinking or not. Um, and then co contextual issues, we talk, we're going to talk about historical trauma and oppression, a little bit more about that, and then current traumas that keep happening. Um, certainly we have to acknowledge that there are some communities that because of how we identify uh, our ethnic and racial um, origins or identity, there's a lot of these things tend to be more prevalent around historical trauma and oppression and then the ongoing pieces around that, which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute, but just being aware of that. Um, so talking about stereotypes, um, it, you know, I don't know about anyone on, who is participating, but um, Speedy Gonzalez definitely um, is an image of the Latino community um, that has been imposed around Latino communities. Um, and I think for a lot of folks, and Speedy Gonzalez disappeared um, uh, from the cartoon universe probably around the 80s perhaps, um, and maybe folks realized that Speedy Gonzalez was a little too stereotypical uh, to have a character. Um, but if you will indulge me, if, if folks are comfortable, when you look at Speedy Gonzalez, what are some, if folks can type in the chat box, what are some of the char physical characteristics that you see? And some of you may be too young to remember Speedy Gonzalez, so I'll acknowledge that, but some of you who are not, you know, what are some of the uh, physical characteristics that you see here? A couple of seconds to, for that.
brown, short, always happy, smiling mm -hmm. is some yep. of the first responses. Okay. Brown, short. Um, for those of you who are old enough to remember Speedy Gonzalez and actually saw him in the television on Saturday morning, um, he also spoke with a heavy, with a heavy accent. Um, he was often running from somebody, which was Sylvester the cat, and I think a lot of, there's been a lot of research around imagery, around cartoons, and some of folks have um, theorized that he was running from law, the law. <laughs> um, so, uh, so these are things that became part of um, the consciousness of folks being aware of Latino identities or communities. Brown, heavy accent, um, you know, uh, poor, uh, all of these things, um, have big, wearing a big sombrero or big hat. Um, so I think this just became this thing around Latino communities and was probably the first introduction to certain Latinos for a lot of folks. Um, and this is something that still happens. Um, some of you may be familiar with Ugly Betty, uh, Dora the Explorer, you know, um, Nacho Libre, um, you know, and then uh, what's uh, Sofia Vergara, who uh, um, comes out in, um, what's the name of that show? Um, I don't know, but it's been, it's a sitcom, it's pretty famous, and she plays this very sultry, very stereotypical Latina in the show. Um, but it's, these are also very... Modern yes. family. Yes, Modern Family, yes. And even the title of that show is a little bit um, stereotypical. But, uh, but these are the ongoing images that sometimes we continue to see from, uh, of Latino communities, of, of Latino communities. And, you know, and it, it continues to happen. And um, so this, this, again, is part of the consciousness of how Latino communities operate, how we talk, how we portray ourselves, um, which may or may not be true. Oh. Okay. I don't know what happened. Can you all see my screen? Josh? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Something. Um, anyway. Um, and so it carries over to these real, real concepts of imagery around Latino communities, right? Um, and it becomes this issue around immigrant equals Latino, Latina equals Mexican, which lumps everyone under one uh, uh, cultural identity, equals illegal, equals criminal, equals deportable. And these are just some expressions of continuing expressions of that. Um, the picture on your left-hand side of the screen where it says illegal aliens at the bottom, it's an actual picture. It's a true picture, but there's history around that picture. Um, this picture uh, is of, actually was taken in Mexico uh, of three-day laborers uh, um, in Mexico. And the picture was, uh, according to the source, was co-opted by someone who was running for office and their platform was around, you know, getting rid, uh, dealing away with illegal aliens in their community. Um, and, you know, and I will admit that in my family, I probably have relatives that look like these two gentlemen in the picture. But again, it's how you frame the picture, how you frame the imagery. Um, and if you look at this image, they all look very criminal-like. But again, who, what's the source? The other picture, the image on your right-hand side of the screen, it's the title Mexican Calendar Girls, and according to the source, this was a fundraiser uh, done by a fraternity at some university. Uh, again, I will acknowledge that I probably have relatives that perhaps dress like this, but again, who is co-opting the imagery, and how are they using the image of Latinos, which again impacts how we do our job, whether we think it, whether we assume it does or it doesn't, these are things that are consistent within the broader culture of certain communities. Of course, in this case, we're talking about Latino, Latina communities. Which brings us to language. 
Um, and I think a lot of times people get a little bit caught up, uh, particularly around the term Latino, Latina, or Hispanic, which to use, which not to use, when to use, or how not to use. Um, and so it becomes this Hispanic versus Latino, what is the difference? So my question to you, if folks are comfortable typing in the chat box, is what, what for you folks, can you type in what would be the difference or if there's a difference between his, Hispanic versus Latino? What, are there any differences? I'll just take a, some, a few seconds for this. Our first response is uh, Hispanic is Spanish descent. Um, next one is Hispanic equals Spanish speaking country, specifically uh, Latina equals Latin America with a question mark. Um, and another person says that they're guessing uh, Hispanic refers to people for, of Spanish descent and Latinos are Latin American. Uh, Latino equals Latin America and a few people have responded that way. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, so in taking, and, and yes, a lot of you, uh, your responses are correct. So when we take, separate, and take the history and origins of each word, Hispanic refers to language. Hispanic, if you and or your ancestry come from a country where they speak Spanish. Latino refers to geography, specifically to Latin America. Um, people from the Caribbean, which is Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic, South America, Bolivia, Colombia, and Central America, Honduras, Costa Rica. In the U.S., Hispanic was first adopted by the U.S. government during the administration of Richard Nixon, um, used in the U.S. Census since 1980. It's used more often in states such as Florida and Texas, and yes, in Texas we use, tend to use Hispanic a lot. Um, and under Latino, the government adopted these terms because they did not have an inclusive term to identify and segregate the mixed white with black and native mestizo or mulatto people of Central and South America. And Hispanic is derived from the term Hispanic comes from Latin word for Spain or Hispania, which later became Espana. It refers to a person of Latin American or I Iberian ancestry affluent, fluent in Spanish. And Latino uh, is shortened from Spanish, Latino Americano, Latin American, thus narrowing the scope of meaning in Central and South America and Spanish-speaking Caribbean islands. So all that to say that um, when using or trying uh, um, to use the term, whether Hispanic or Latino, it just depends. Um, I know that a lot of the younger generations of Hispanics, quote unquote, have, re, have are using Latino um, just because it's more comprehensive. Um, and certainly you can get into the nuances of Chicano identity, but that's a very, very specific. Um, so what do you do? Do we use the term Hispanic or Latino in the literature? It just depends on the community and also depends on the person, how they identify. So it's always good to ask. And again, not all Latinos, and of course with the National Latino Network, we use the term Latino because we consider it to be a more broader umbrella term um, as described under the Latino column. But certainly people may identify differently. Um, so just being aware of that language and terminology. So Latino or Hispanic, as I mentioned, um, you know, for some folks, Hispanic is very derogatory. It is not representative of who they are, where they come from. And a lot of times, Hispanic, as we've learned, it, it's very specific to, to uh, folks who come from uh, Spain. It doesn't include the other folks who may be in, uh, Afro-Latino, indigenous cultures of Latin America. But just being aware of these nuances. And again, language is ever evolving. Um, so it just depends. So just being aware of that. Um, part of it in, in talking about language and uh, how to identify folks is also looking at examining cultural competency versus, versus cultural responsiveness and how it impacts the work. Um, 
and I apologize, it's just, it's not, it, should, it just basically should say how it impacts our work, whether in the court system, if you're an advocate that works with court systems or at a shelter um, or at a rape crisis center. Um, these are two things that are very similar and different at the same time. So, and a lot of times we have heard the term cultural competency being said uh, 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 many times and um, and this would be considered a cultural competency training. And personally, I am very challenged by that term, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if, again, if folks can indulge me uh, and put in your response, what is cultural responsiveness? If you all can put that answer in the chat box. Realizing the culture is a component of everyone we serve and need to be aware of that and then, and then respond appropriately. Okay. Um, considering the individual's unique identities and cultural, social, environmental context when providing services. Uh, also tailoring response to cultural behaviors and identities. Awesome. Great. Um, so, in looking at going back to the term, what is cultural competency, uh, about both individual and institutional practices, so that's what we look, uh, what we deal with when we talk about cultural competency. It's characterized by acceptance and respect for differences. Um, it's about continuous self-assessments regarding culture with special attention to respect and for the dynamics of differences. But sometimes when we use the cultural competency, it also creates this assumption that as amazing as this training is in, in, <laughs> or whatever, it doesn't mean you, you learned everything about um, uh, someone's community or identity. Cultural competency kind of sets that up that it's just like, okay, I take this training or I take this class on a certain issue, then I'm competent in it. Well, no, that's just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, it is a continuum. Of, of the conversation, you know, um, it's a change mandated for tolerance, um, destruction, and capacity blindness. So it's like eliminate differences, demean differences, dismiss differences, and then change chosen for transformation. Pre-competence is acknowledge and start to respond to differences. Competence is understand the difference the different differences make, and then. Um, proficiency learned from and grow because of differences. And I think um, it's always important anytime we talk about, or when we do this presentation at, at, at the network, we always kind of, we, we start to talk, we start the conversation by talking about, and also including questions around cultural competency and cultural responsiveness. Um, and part of cultural responsiveness is also having cultural humility, which is kind of like a new, not a new buzzword, but it's definitely something that has been introduced slowly around advocacy work. Um, I know um, it's been done a lot around primary prevention. So the process of cultural humility means that a person learns to recognize and reject their pre-existing beliefs about culture, whatever that means. And, what, and whatever context culture is being referenced to. Focuses on understanding information provided individuals with context at hand. So again, it's not just having the term and reading a definition, it's also looking at the context, how it's being used, how it's being referenced at that point. Um, and forgoes the temptation to classify or label persons. And again, we live in systems um, where we have to categorize people in order to qualify for services. In the case of sexual assault, people need to be categorized or labeled as a victim of sexual assault, even though the person may not, especially if they need to access services. And of course, we've done training around, you know, we use the terminology when it needs to, but if the person doesn't identify, we don't refer to them as such. Um, but again, cultural humility kind of begins this extra layer of the conversation. Okay, it's not just about 
I take this three hour training or whatever and I'm done. It's about really challenge, challenging ourselves to really try not to label people and then strategically use those categories when they have to be. But if the person doesn't embrace those, then we shouldn't use those labels to refer them as such, um, which sometimes can be very difficult. And which means also looking at the work from an intersectional perspective, um, looking at the intersections of identity, looking at racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, all these isms that kind of come into the forefront when we're actually trying to assist or engage uh, sexual, sexual assault survivors and however they identify, in this case we're talking about Latino communities, um, you know, describes experiences of multiple oppression simultaneously, um, examines how intersections between identities interact with systems of oppression, contributing to systemic injustice and social inequalities. You know, these are big terms um, we're, we're, I'm talking about here, but in reality, you do, we do this work on a daily basis. For those of us who are advocates, who are advocating with survivors of sexual assault, we're taking them to appointments around housing, taking them to court appointments, uh, visitation for children. We're actually doing all this work already, except the language that we use in our system, we call it advocacy. Um, and we base our advocacy around the cultural identity of victimology, of victimization, in this case, sexual assault. And that is a cultural identity. Being identified by a system as a victim of sexual assault is a, it's its own cultural identity that carries its own stereotypes, its own misinformation around what that means or who a person who may be labeled or who may identify as a victim of sexual assault or a survivor of sexual assault. But then you have the extra layer around sexism and, and all of these things. So again, we cannot just focus around the identity of victimology or victimization, we also have to look deeper than that. And again, we're already doing it, but we just use different terminology, we use different words. Which kind of comes into this contextual factors or framework when we talk about folks. Um, and again, I'll emphasize this again, you know, I'm, I'm using generalities here and also trying to use specifics at the same time, which can be very challenging. But um, when we talk about Latino communities, we have to talk about, again, cultural values, how religion and spirituality play into this, economic factors, anti-immigrant environments, which is currently happening. All of these things we have to play out and consider and deal with, because that could be the overriding issue of concern for the person. Um, and how does that fold into our advocacy work if the person identifies or has been labeled or identified as a victim or survivor of sexual assault. All of these things come into play. How do we deal with that? And how as an advocate who may not identify, and even if you identify with the Latino community, it doesn't mean that you automatically know. It doesn't mean because every person has, its, have their, has their own individual experiences, their own individual realities, and how they navigate now that they've been labeled or been identified as a victim or survivor of sexual assault, how they fold that into their contextual realities of their uh, community, their neighborhood, uh, within their immediate family, and how do we talk about that and all of these things. And again, looking at the context, um, which means we look at the experience, the consciousness and the reality of the situation for folks. Um, and trying and to also understand that um, these are all inter, interlocking, intersecting within the same person. And again, they all may be different based on the person's experience, consciousness, and reality. So when we talk about experience, it's about the daily experience of the Latino survivor or the a Latino person. We talk, we, are, we talk about factors such as age, um, in the case of it's an immigrant survivor, when they immigrated or where they were born, if they were born here. Um, educational level, and socioeconomic level, here, uh, here and in their country of origin, if they, happen to meet, if they happen to have immigrated to the U.S. 
language ability in both Spanish and English, um, immigration status, past experience with mainstream citizens and individuals. And again, experience can be broad, um, and these factors may not necessarily um, apply to that person, but I'm just using them as examples of what we need to consider when we're trying to engage survivors from Latino communities. And again, these are just broad generalities that we're making. It can be very specific, or they, these things could exist, or these things could not be a part of their overriding experience for the person or the survivor, which means we have to talk about historical trauma. Um, so um, my question to you is, has, has anyone of the participants heard of what historical trauma before, heard the term historical trauma before? And what does that mean? Can we define that, please? You've got a couple of guesses waiting on definitions. OK. That as a minority, even if a specific white person has never done me wrong, historically there have been uh, people who have hurt my people so I can carry the internal bias upon meeting someone new. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Um, so in talking about the experience, we have to talk, we have to acknowledge around historical trauma. So historical trauma is is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations um, from mass group trauma. You know, this, this term was first coined by Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, um, who identifies as um, uh, indigenous. Native Americans have for over 500 years endured physical, it's an example of physical, emotional, social, spiritual genocide from European and American colonial policies. Again, this is just an example. We certainly acknowledge, and I acknowledge, there, is, there are other communities of color that have also experienced this. Um, but historical trauma kind of accounts for that ongoing from the past to the present to the future that has happened and that we do carry um, from generation to generation. So we look at this from a triple trauma, quote unquote, effect, um, because Latino communities have been have become like the face for immigrants and refugees, it seems like. Um, so we look at sources of conflict, civil war disasters, again, ongoing historical trauma, which is present day of civil war, immigrants' journeys and status in the U.S. Um, the triple trauma can happen from home, oppression, conflict, gender-based violence in home countries, um, in the transition or in the immig uh, immigration of the process violence on transit routes and, count, and countries in camps, resettlement uh, systems and community failures in resettlement countries, um, and the impact, the impact is broad and varied and also very specific and individual, and also depending on who is, um, again, uh, carrying the conversation, it can be taken away from the community that has been that has suffered historical and ongoing trauma in that aspect. So the impact can be from, in this case, we can see that in the aspect of maybe um, imbalance of gender equity in relationships, and that can mean so many things. Um, you know, we can talk about other things as well, but just looking at all these aspects as part of the experience of some folks, of some communities, consciousness, the way of thinking, how we, how the person or how certain Latino communities may process this. Again, socialized within an extended family structure, interdependent, highly re relational, storytelling as a method of communication, great importance around traditions, living in the moment, not in the future, 
And again, these are some generalizations around conscious a way of thinking for some Latino communities. It could be different. Uh, that could be influenced depending on whether they're second, third generation. They may be more uh, assimilated to the broader culture or not. Um, so again, we also have to consider all these factors around the way we think, and it also impacts of how some Latino communities may think or process around um, sexual assault, uh, sexual harassment, or what have you. But again, I don't want to go there where it becomes this, oh, all Latinos are like this. It's like, no, no, because we can certainly uh, identify this across the board in many different communities from many different uh, ethnic or racial backgrounds. Uh, but again, these are just some things that could be generalized. Um, and so we look at these things as also strengths as well. Um, individual and collective factors have buffered the effects of collective trauma. So we look at cultural traditions, strong cultural identity, cultural stories. So in the work that we do at Casa Esperanza National Latina Network, uh, when we conduct our research, for example, when we are developing the questions, we don't ask questions around how many times were you a victim of sexual assault, for example. We ask questions of, that focus on a strength-based perspective. So we ask folks, what are your aspirations? What are your goals? What do you want to do? What do you want for your family? What do you want for yourself? What do you want for your children? What do you want for your community? Because that taps in into the cultural traditions and to the cultural identity of the community of the person of, of strength. And a lot of times our services are based around intervention, which is separating the victim or the survivor from their communities, which sometimes we have to for safety reasons. But a lot of times, inadvertently, we may be separating the person or the family from their source of, of strength or their source of healing. Um, so we have to also consider this, you know, looking at all these things. And then when we ask questions, instead of asking the questions in the deficit, maybe ask in the strength base. What type of music do you like to hear? What kind of food do you like? You know, do you belong to a faith community? Um, all these things. Um, and that is important because that also builds trust. And you also are starting to learn or starting to be aware of the person and who they are, where they come from, instead of just focusing on the intake question and focus on, focusing on, um, you know, um, um, where, how many times were they victims, who was victimized in their, in their, uh, um, in their family, so looking at all these things very differently from a very different perspective. Um, then looking again, um, Um, then looking again, looking again at the um, more extensively, um, historically have not had, so looking at um, around um, access to certain services, historically looking at had not access to individual services, um, may include abuses by entire systems. Again, going back to the whole historical trauma, which is the experience, the consciousness, then also incorporating uh, issues of social justice and human rights perspective, which is part of this conversation. And I think sometimes that may scare some folks around the human rights perspective. It's such a big word, and folks may have images of folks who are protesting in marches or what have you. But again, this is the work that we do on a daily basis. We just call it advocacy. When you are accompanying a survivor to a court hearing, you're actually doing social justice work because you are interacting with all these different systems, translating legalese to plain speak for the survivor or to whoever the, the, or the survivors, um, and also making sure the person understands what their rights are in the process. So we are doing the work, um, except again, we just call it advocacy. And again, we move to reality, uh, which is addressing components around how people live, how they carry their lives in their own personal lives. Um, so this is where um, the concept of family comes first, regardless of good or bad, triumph or turmoil. Uh, definitely family is the construct, or the concept of that. And also understand that family is, the, is broadly defined for some Latino communities. 
uh, speaking from personal experience, um, just my own experience and what I've seen in my immediate circle. My, for example, my parents are godparents to a whole bunch of, of children in my neighborhood, and they're considered family. Um, so being so family, construct family for some Latino communities is not the 2.5 whatever. It is much broader than that. And so family could also extend to the neighborhood uh, or the neighbors. Um, um, daily decisions are based on, on the, the whole, or not the individual for the most part. And again, we're going back to uh, spirituality, faith practices are, are sometimes fundamentally, fundamentally influence some of these uh, expectations. And again, if we are referencing um, sexual assault, it could really it could influence how the survivor may um, have the strength to deal with sex with the assault or the sexual assault. Um, so again, for a lot of folks who may who may identify as part of the Latino community, uh, faith going to a community of faith may be a very fundamental piece of their healing. Um, so I think I'm going to pause here. From are there any questions so far from the participants? We've covered a lot so far, but I just want to. Nothing's popped up yet, Jose Juan. Okay, thank you. Um, again, if folks have any questions, please feel free to to, to type them in the chat box. Again, this is a dialogue. Um, so when we start narrowing the construct of the conversation around Latinos and domestic violence or sexual assault or human trafficking or, or gender-based violence, um, we also have to acknowledge that part of that is we still are lacking a lot of information around this. Um, a lot of the studies around certain cultural or ethnic communities are being done by, again, what we ref reference to as mainstream organizations, universities, institutions. And how they ask the questions, again, may not account for the cultural responsiveness or the cultural strengths of that community. So we're still lacking a lot of information, a lot of studies, a lot of research around, generally speaking, around domestic violence, sexual assault within Latino communities and how that and how that representative in our Latino community. Um, um, and so what is published must be considered within the context of how the information is collected, as I mentioned. Questions as how the social community conditions where the, where the research was obtained, um, you know, new immigration laws, for example, that, that could be a very significant part as to why uh, Latino survivors may not be coming to the crisis centers for services. Um, and certainly we are experiencing that. We are hearing that at the national level from all, many different culture-specific Latino organizations. Um, so, and if you don't, if you don't have the analysis to maybe ask those questions, perhaps you are, you are completely ignoring a whole set of realities, um, consciousness, experiences, and because you lack the, perhaps you lack the analysis to ask those questions, right? Um, so again, we still are missing a lot of conversation, a lot of research around these particular intersections, um, and it's an ongoing process. We do have so a when question. We talk about, yes. Um, how would you phrase things in a strength-based form if you are a first responder at a scene where some, uh, someone from the Latino community was sexually assaulted? That's a very good question. Um, I think I would, well, it just depends on how the person reacts to you. Um, what is, what is the person uh, reacting to? What are their, what are they, what are they stating to you that is their primary concern? And focus, I would think focus on that. Are they frightened? Are they scared? Um, what, what are they mentioning at the time? Because um, again, you know, they may not identify as a sexual assault victim because that's a big term. They just perhaps just know that they were hurt by somebody or someone. Um, and so focus on are they safe? Do they feel safe? What do they need at this moment? 
and then figure out the rest later. Um, it's like when people come to um, the crisis center, you know, we try to set them up first, like address the concerns that they have. Because a lot of times you may have, for example, you may have a survivor of sexual assault or domestic violence that comes into this, the center and um, they were referred by somebody, great, we're going to help them. But their primary concern is, I have kids I have to worry about. Uh, rent's due tomorrow. I don't know what to do. Right? Um, of course, you're dealing with the crisis at the moment. So I guess it also depends on at the moment of crisis. What is the overriding crisis that you're having to deal with first? Um, and just ask questions like, how, you know, is there, how can I help you? Or do you have family? Um, but I guess it just depends on the, on the circumstance. There really is no clear response to this. Um, but again, if you're in the immediate response, if you're called out to, on, if you're on call and you go to an on-site situation, you have to deal with the safety and security of the person first, I think. And I don't know if that answers the question. Or if someone else has a, a suggestion, please uh, share. Are there any other questions? Uh, no, but the person who posed that question says thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So um, again, in talking about this issue, uh, Latinos and family community violence, we also have to address this broader context of violence that the broader community is experiencing on a daily basis. Uh, Many survivors may not want to leave their families and communities. They want, um, they just want, just like anyone else, they may want the violence to end or they want to deal with the violence, someone to do, help them deal with the abuse or the violence to stop. Um, again, family can be a crucial part of it, but also you have to define what family means to that person, who is your immediate family. And again, sometimes for some folks, it could be the aunts, the cousins, somebody. And it's not just like the, immediate partners or children, it could be someone else in the family. Uh, addressing domestic, uh, family violence, sexual assault may not be the more pressing issue again in their lives. As I mentioned before, it could be just the issue of where am I going to go to, how am I going to survive, I may have, they may have a job, all of these things. Um, but again, it's just a, it's a case by case uh, situation. Um, Community, family and community violence, um, again, the issue around caring for the children, um, misinformation about immigration status, often is maybe the overriding concern about accessing services. Um, again, survive, Latino survivors may face a number of barriers to obtaining services within the current um, system of help that may exist. Um, and again, we also have to acknowledge that there are a lot of us out there who are in the helping systems that may be biased towards certain communities. Um, so that's why we all, I always encourage folks, don't just refer someone somewhere, actually get to know that system, that collaborating partner, um, because you, ne you don't know who you're standing, you never know who you're standing to and why and how they're going to react. And again, issues of isms exist in any system uh, of help, potentially. Um, so it's always important just to get to know your neighbors, who are the organizations you're interacting with, who are you trying to build collaboration with, and so on and so forth. Again, as I mentioned, it may not be the most pressing issue for the person. Um, we have to look at immigration issues. We have to look at family issues, money. Um, a lot of times people have to relocate in order to get into a safe place, but that might be the neighboring county. Uh, so take, take into account the geography, all these things. And for some of us, it's easy to say, get up and move, but is it? So every time you pose an option, you should always think, huh, how would I like it if someone told me I need to leave now without any question as to why? And then, and just dealing with the victimization, not even considering the cultural ties of this person to that community and what does it look like and how is it going to look like for this person. 
So we look at this galaxy of individuality on these extra layers that are happening at the same time. Um, and again, perhaps for a lot of us, this is like a review, but it's also good to just to recenter ourselves in these conversations and look at these different layers a person is in the middle of. Uh, you know, children, family of origin, communities of faith, uh, schools, work, service agencies, state laws, and then whole issue around culture, class, ethnicity, philosophy, human rights. Does it exist? Does it not exist in those communities? And then barriers to how they become barriers to services. Um, and so for me, this is how it looks like in my advocacy work. And I've tried to, you know, been doing this work for almost uh, 19 years now. And then what I've learned through that time is looking at all this aspect from that lens and looking that, you know, um, they're not just a victim of this form of violence, but they're also, they may identify as an immigrant, as a Latino, maybe they're part of the lesbian, gay, bi, or trans community. They may be a minor. And how these different systems of help pushes and pull a person in many different directions. And then how am I, as the advocate, going to intercept and intervene and maybe also hopefully prevent some of these pushing and pulling for this person in the middle of the system, of these systems of help? And I think a lot of times we get this narrow vision of, again, well, I'm the, you know, it's my intake, my intake overwrites a lot of things, you have to do this, it's like, no, um, you know, we're going to refer this person to housing, we're going to refer this person to counseling, but are they culturally responsive to the, to the, to their needs of the person, to the survivor, um, is there language access issues, fears around all these other systems as well, so how do we look at this person in this process? So again, barriers, uh, lack of knowledge and misinformation about U.S. legal systems, again, you know, or systems of help, um, linguistic and cultural barriers. Um, I think a lot of things that we also do, one of the things that we also help uh, with organizations is around language access and how to develop a language access plan for a lot of communities, um, because language is a big part of it, and um, sometimes we get calls from um, organizations where people don't turn up because of language access issues. Discrimination, we have to acknowledge that exists, and even in our crisis centers that exist. Um, economic and employment challenges, isolation from family and community, again, just reinforcing all those things. Um, the importance of, again, strength-based advocacy, acknowledging survivors' courage and strength always. Um, because I, and I think people may know this or not, but I'm gonna say it anyway, we are in the business of outing people. And what do I mean by that? In order for a person to access any of these services, any of these organizational services, they first need to come out first as what? As a victim of sexual assault. And what we know that already know is that being labeled or categorized as a victim of sexual assault, even against the desire of the person or the survivor, carries stereotypes around that. And we know that because every time we've uh, uh, accompanied a survivor to a court hearing, for example, we often hear opposing counsel capitalize on the stereotypes, the gender stereotypes of the person. And I won't go into what examples, but you all know what I'm talking about. Right? And so we have to acknowledge the fact that we are outing people. They have to come out as a victim of sexual assault first. To their, and then they have to do that. And how are they going to do that in a culturally responsive way, in a safe way, within the communities they come from? Um, you know, and strength-based. Um, asking the survivor what their goals are and priorities. Once we've dealt, you know, in the process, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other, but throughout the process of, you know, dealing with the immediate crisis and getting the person to a safe place in their life or as safe as they can be for themselves. Um, but you still carry over a lot of these conversations, you know, okay, so what do you want to do? You know, what are your goals? All of that. Understanding and building community resources and networks at the same time. 
So, but this trans, if you're going to be, if you're going to put a strength-based perspective, is that you need to take the extra step. It's actually getting to know the people, the uh, the other folks you're refer, of uh, the other organizations you are referring the people to, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis if you can, uh, which means you need to get out of your office if you're able to, and I understand a lot of us come, may come from smaller organizations, but again, part of our strengths-based advocacy is getting to know those organizations we are referring people to. And asking beyond that, it's like, okay, what kind of uh, language access do you have? Do you have bicultural, bilingual staff in that organization, right? And even within your own organizations as well. Uh, strengthening community engagement, Again, um, going into community when you have, because we always do these organize, we, some of us organize community events, right? We may have health fairs, we may have conferences, what have you. It's like, okay, so who are you inviting to these and where are you having this community event? Are you having them, because where you, where you have these events is also very significant. Are you having it in a, community-based health clinic or community center, or are you having it in city hall, where it may take the person two bus trips to get down there? Well, that may not be accessible for certain folks, and that is not strength-based. So having your events within the communities you're trying to engage and collaborating with uh, uh, community partners from those communities. Um, creating a comprehensive framework. Um, just, for, you know, uh, understanding that sexual assault violates the human rights, and we understand that, right? Uh, violates the human rights of survivors of children who may be impacted by creating unsafe and fearful environments. Um, safety must be central to any work that we do. That's without saying, but it has to be culturally responsive as well. Uh, Safety is unattainable, unattainable unless we practice cultural and linguistic competency. Again, um, how we communicate with folks. Um, who is who, is the staff in your organization reflective of the communities you're trying to engage? And that goes from people in the front lines, from folks to uh, answer your phones, to people who are on your board and who are <laughs> trying to create funding in your organization. It's an entire comprehensive reframing of the work. So what we know, and these are the kind of things we also put into practice at the at at the in our, my organ, in our organization, my organization. You know, challenges. You know, just put it in a framework that it's visible, and you can you know create some kind of layer layering around it. What is working? What are the challenges? How do you address it? What gets in the way, what would be of help to you. Um, and these, again, these, one of the things that, that we do at Casa Esperanza is every, every so often we will um, look at our programming because we're one of the few national organizations that we also have still direct services, so we do have a shelter. Um, so every so often we will look at our programming and we will go back to community and ask them, these are the things that we provide. Are these still priority in your community? And we do have um, what we call platicas or conversational circles um, in different community-friendly spaces, and we ask these questions. And then whatever comes up, if that redirects some of the programming, shifts some of the programming, priorities programming, we challenge ourselves to do it or we try to find ways to do it within community. It's not an easy process, but again, being culturally responsive to diverse communities requires a lot of assessment from the organization, which is another thing we also provide at the, at the network. Jose Juan, we've got a question yes. for a, from a participant. Um, what ideas do you have when it comes to rural communities where there aren't agencies to refer um, Two that have access to individuals who are Latino, um, specifically language barriers, no bicultural staff at the other organizations, no public transport, et cetera. I would look, so there's usually, um, this is kind of like a staple answer, but looking at faith communities, 
a lot of times faith communities draw in a lot of um, culturally specific communities as well. Um, looking at schools and see what type of after school programming they may have. So if you want as far as like looking at, yeah, so look, you know, try to think creatively uh, outside of the spectrum of what, of the folks we usually interact when we're trying to engage services for a survivor. Uh, so looking at faith-based communities, looking at schools and what they're providing, um, looking at other culturally specific organizations in those communities, in rural communities, and sometimes they may not exist. Um, sometimes it's just relegated around faith community, but just trying to broaden and being creative around that. Um, and sometimes you may not have that. So sometimes, um, you know, maybe looking at your staff as well as what they what are they seeing, what what are they doing, and, and all of that. But I think that's where you start, just thinking creatively and looking at um, what's going on in their community. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, just, and then also reach out to us. Reach out to, like, you can also reach out to us and we can uh, find, because um, we have a, a big list of, of culture-specific organizations that may address Latino communities. Um, in your community, so you'd be you'd be surprised. So you can definitely reach out to organizations like mine. We can try to network folks to other culturally specific organizations. Um, yeah, when in doubt, call us. Uh, Jose Juan, I would like to also. This is Agatha, by the way. I would also like to add that um, for our knowledge here in the state, there's a lot of different immigrant uh, circles like this uh, CERC, which is the Colorado Immigrant Rights. And there's also uh, the Latino, Latino Community Network or something like that. Um, if you reach out to me, I will be happy to send you a lot, a list of that. CERC has a really amazing network all around the state. So for those who want that kind of information, I will be more than happy to reach, uh, uh, provide those net connections to you if you reach out to me via email. Um, that's uh, what else to leave it. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, so, you know, when you think of safety, this is a, that, that question was actually a very good <laughs> question around when thinking of safety, uh, you know, think about sexual assault or domestic violence, you know, what comes to mind and just being creative around that. And to me, um, if you're dealing with someone who may, English is not their first language, thinking about language access and how does not having language access become a safety precaution for that family or that person or those communities. Um, so thinking along those lines. Um, you know, thinking about safety, financial stability, um, you know, just, and these are things that everyone wants. We all want to live a life safely with financial stability, healthy families, wanting to increase our education, perhaps, um, you know, legal stability. These are things that we all want and then sometimes may not have because of how we call, we identify. And so these are things actually um, to consider when you are, again, trying to expand your engagement with different or diverse communities. And again, every community may have their own nuanced challenges. In the case of lesbian, gay, bi, and trans communities, you also have to think about the issue of outing people and how does that impact the safety plan, the intake services, or the service plan. Um, so thinking about these different nuances within different communities, and again, also acknowledging that a lot of communities may, inter may be part of these various intersect intersections of cultural identity. So you may have a transgender Latina survivor of sexual assault. Whoa. So how do I modify or how do I expand the issue around safety planning, the issue around finding financial stability, which could be through housing referrals, all of that. How do I deal with health? If, I, if, my, if the person is a trans Latina immigrant, limited English speaking survivor, um, needs medical attention, and that, if I refer them to the local community clinic, health clinic, how is that going to play out? 
you know, um, all of these things. So again, starting to think in layers and starting to think what are all these things we need to consider in order to help this person or these communities. Jose Juan, we have another question. Yes. Yes. If a Latina survivor's family is not supportive of their decision to leave the abuser, where could you help guide them to find culturally relevant support uh, systems? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think it's just, um, well, first of all, you need to ask what they want. <laughs> um, and sometimes we know that sometimes we have to work within the confines of the family and how do we create safety planning while the person is still working or navigating within the family system. Um, so I think the, the better question is how have our services engaged not just the individual but also communities, period? How do we start shifting or engaging the conversation around sexual violence within diverse communities? And if we don't have or we don't possess the identity to do so, how do we do with collaborating, meaningful collaboration with other organizations? And, and I, I know I'm taking the conversation to a broader conversation, but I think that's where we need to start thinking. Now, as far as to the individual, you always have to check in with the person. So is there anyone else in your family that you can turn to? Um, you know, and then looking at that, but then Again, so once you start as an organization dealing with the bigger pictures, then things that are more individual start to become a little bit less complicated. And I don't know if that answers the question, but um, I think you just have to check in with the person first. Um, and that, if you have to ask that question, you always have to flip it to your, the organization. If we are asking this question, then what are we as an organization are not doing to answer this question ourselves. Um, so again, meaningful collaborations with other culturally specific organizations, calling, you know, calling the coalition, you know, Agada has, <laughs> you know, that's what she's, Josh and Agada, that's what they're there for. Um, so I guess it's just very individual and I think it just depends, just checking in with the person first and seeing are there other family, is there other family you have that you can communicate with? Uh, do you go, is there a faith community that you belong to, uh, you know, yeah. I hope that answers the question. Or maybe not. But again, these are things about part of this conversation is to start thinking about as an organization, if we are asking these questions like how do we refer correctly or how do we refer safely being culturally responsive, then that's something we need to address as an organization. If that makes sense. Any other questions? For Agada, do you have any other suggestions? Or folks, participants have any um, ideas? Um, are you all still there? <laughs> Yes, we are. I was waiting to see if anything would uh, come through, but there's nothing at this point. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so what we want for Latino survivors, again, safety, uh, more specifically trust and systems that enhance their safety, um, includes access to housing, employment, transportation, all of that, uh, reproductive health, mental health, um, legal stability, as we mentioned already. And again, how do we get there? It's collaboration. I think the answer is really collaboration. Um, it cannot, you know, again, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, partnerships with Latino survivors and other program services need to be intentional, thoughtful, as already mentioned, uh, culturally relevant advocacy service and support. Um, is it fluid and flexible? You know, you can't just say, well, we've developed this program, this is how it works, and this is how we're going to do it. No, because you also have to understand that community, the makeup of community shifts, it changes. Um, one day you may have more, just break it down by, for example, demographic, you may have um, Latinos of Mexican descent is a bigger community in your area, but then the next two years, 
you have a bigger um, Cuban population or folks who identify as part of the Cuban community that's bigger and how does that change that? So you just can't assume once we have outreach programs for Latino survivors, this is it like, no, that could probably change depending on the fluidity and the, the makeup and the character of the Latino communities in your uh, communities, in your areas. Um, starting with agreements that agencies, program, organizations, and services will work together to ensure that they're providing appropriate services. Again, this is where looking at culture-specific organizations and having meaningful collaborations with them. Um, so what Casa de Esperanza does a lot of what we call co-advocacy. So for example, um, we may have uh, a limited English-speaking Latina survivor at the neighboring crisis center in, in the town over. Um, and they don't have uh, Spanish-speaking or bilingual staff. So they'll call us, and so we'll do some co-advocacy with them. And we both provide services to the, to the survivor, um, but there's also reciprocating relationship in that um, uh, collaboration. It's not just like a one-way conversation because I think a lot of times culture-specific organizations may may tend to be um, overburdened because uh, mainstream organizations don't have bicultural or bilingual staff or what have you. But again, there has to be meaningful reciprocation around those relationships. Um, ongoing communication, sharing information, um, understanding that you know, I'm always in favor of cross-training folks. Uh, doesn't mean that I need to be an expert in your field, but I just definitely need to know the foundations of what you do and how you do it and why you do it um, and where you do it and with who you, and with whom. Because um, I can read a brochure, I can go to your website, and I can read it. But I, what I really want to know is what you're not able to do, so that way I know I don't refer the client to you. Uh, I don't want to waste that person's time, and I don't want to waste your time. Because if we're dealing with people's safety, you know, exposing people to, to going to appointments is not what I'm here about. Um, and if they're going to be disrespected because of how they culturally identify, or speak English with an accent, or dress differently, or whatever, you know, that's not meaningful collaboration. That's just a waste of time. So again, it has to be reciprocating, sharing information and knowledge. And again, um, you know, it has to be flexible, um, being open-minded, um, effective communication, cross-training, as I mentioned before, um, and then establish protocols and evaluation processes. Again, um, always having, as an organization, assessing where you're at every so often and are the services working? Are they only working for a certain pop sector of the population? What's going on? So again, you do you and again you do that with meaningful collaborations with other organizations, but then you have to start within the organ your organization first. So I think we have like five, four minutes left. Um, so I can stop here for questions. If you uh, do want to just keep on talking, if there's anything else that you would like to touch on um, while everybody has some time to chat in those questions, sure. you can do that. Sure. Um, yeah, and I guess at, at the end of the day, I also want to acknowledge the fact that, um, you, know, I've, you know, I've worked as an advocate at a crisis center, and I really appreciate the challenges and limitations of what we are able to work with, because I... We come from nonprofit sector, and I completely appreciate that. So I do want to acknowledge the fact that you know the work that we do is very difficult. It's very challenging. Um, it seems like every day we're being asked to do more and more and more. But also at the end of the day, we are definitely held to a higher standard because we're dealing people with, with safety. And I don't want to come off like this is what you need to do. This is not. This <laughs> these are as I mentioned before. This is an open dialogue and conversation. Um, you know, we can definitely, my organization, my organization does provide training and technical assistance, and these are things that we do with organizations. We talk through with organization, organizations on how to build more culturally responsive services, of course, in the case with Latino communities. 
but I think the foundations of that can can be uh, extrapolated to other diverse communities. It just has to be nuanced depending on the person's where they come from, how they primarily or may primarily identify, and all these other layers around their cultural and ethnic identity. So I'm definitely not here to tell you what to do. Um, this information is just information to help you expand your knowledge. Um, there is no one set way of doing things. It is broad and flexible and ever-changing, so I just want to make sure that to the participants. Uh, and we definitely at Casa Esperanza don't have all the answers. But I think in understanding the cultural makeup and character of each community, that's where we start. And that's where we start to have more dialogue and understanding and conversation. So we have two questions that have popped up. Uh, uh, would you like them both at the same time or one then the other? Uh, it's one, let's do one and then do the other. Okay. Do you have any suggestions regarding prevention efforts? Prevention efforts, well, what do you mean by that? Because there's so many things you can do with that. Um, While they're responding um, to your specificity, I will ask the other question, uh, which is, as a cis white female, I have had a Latino, or I've had Latino clients use the term illegals to describe undocumented immigrants. How might you suggest we address this or not? Um, I think it's about reemphasizing the terminology and and um, that you use. So if you use undocumented immigrants or immigrant survivors, and then that's the terminology you use, I think you just have to repeat it. I'm not one for telling people how to say things, especially if, if they come from that from a certain community. Um, but I think there's always the, and I'm always curious to find out. Well, why do you use the term illegal? Right? I wouldn't ask them that directly. I would probably just in conversation start to get to know a person a little bit more as to why they use certain terminology. Um, and again, all these isms also exist internally for every one of us. Uh, certainly I am not above homophobia, racism. I sometimes am challenged around terminology. Um, but I think you just through conversation and asking certain questions, you know, um, the longer you do this work, the more you know how to ask questions without asking the question, if you know what I mean. Um, and you get to, you know, and you learn a lot about that. But I think if you just reaffirm the language that you use, like uh, immigrant survivors, immigrant survivors, immigrant survivors, immigrant survivors, <laughs> I think eventually folks start using the language and start catching up and oh, okay, um, yeah. So the clarification to that first question is prevention efforts regarding middle and high school preventions, uh, specifically where there would be a large range of cultural responsiveness. Um, it does, I think that would depend on so many things, um, but I think the way we practice in our communities with the, the philosophy that we use at Casa Esperanza is to community engagement principles. So we ask, we check in with community first. What is it that you want as a community? What are some of the issues or concerns that are overriding, especially you know from a age demographic? Because again, you have to consider that um, even though this may be a Latino youth that come from Latino communities, their experiences are so individual. So I think just you know ha checking in with community and asking those questions. Okay. So what's going on in community? How do you feel about these issues? And you can, you can use, you know, we can talk about dating violence or, or sexual violence within um, uh, young relationships and defining the terminology, but then carry it bigger to that. It's like, so, but what do you all think? What do you, how do you define this, right? Um, and again, that's, that's also an area that we do a lot of work on around community engagement principles is actually develop um, a toolkit um, that's called uh, Leaderist Model or the Leadership Model. And we've used it not only for adults, but we've also used it for uh, young adults or teens or minors, um, which is something we can definitely have a conversation on. So, um, yeah. 
Wonderful. Any well, we don't have any other questions that have popped up, um, but I would just really like to thank you, Jose Juan, and all of the attendees for our time together today, um, discussing this really, really, really important topic and hopefully gaining a lot of uh, really informative insights around this topic. So thank you so much, Jose Juan. Is there anything else that you would like to um, discuss before we close out? No, again, just want to thank you, the Colorado Coalition Against Sexual Assault, Agatha and Josh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the participants. Um, for taking your time from your lunch and engaging in this conversation. Um, again, um, they, you'll have my contact information in the PowerPoint that they send out to you. Please feel free to reach out to me. These are issues that are always require long-term conversation and dialogue. There is no one said answer, but there's definitely a lot of possibility and opportunity around these, these issues. So thank you again for the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And then for our attendees, I just wanted to let you know um, before we all close out that there will be another culturally specific webinar on June 19th from 12 to 1 p.m. facilitated by SOUL, um, S Survivors Organizing for Liberation. And the title for that is Best Practices and Working with LGBTQ Survivors of Violence. So we hope you all will look out for our announcements um, and registration information for that webinar and hope that everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you all so much again for being with us.